Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Rainus. Um, I'm the one who'll be taking you uh, through the classes for risk management, and I offer uh, RSK 4803, uh, 04, and 05 as well. So there was a bit of uh, uncertainty and confusion regarding exactly when registration is due to end. Uh, we prepared our timetable with the thought that registration was uh, was ending on the 7th of March, but it seems that the registration has been extended to end on the 31st of March as well. And we have a lot of students who are still waiting for their results. So they are going to get their results, then register for the other modules as well. So because of that, it means that the results for the previous year students have not been uh, out as yet. So we are going to uh, start with the classes, but we are not going to move uh, as fast as we usually do on the first class as well, because we don't want to leave them uh, too far behind. So you see that today's class is not going to take too long, because I just want to introduce you to exactly uh, what we're going to be covering, what is expected of the module, how you can best, uh, best attempt and go through the module as well. And uh, we're going to be looking at uh, unit study unit one so, so that I can give you guideline of exactly how to do unit one as well. So um, before we start, are there any questions on anything that I need to clarify? Any questions? All right, um, so with uh, risk financing, you will see that it's, um, they are basically trying to put together uh, risk management and integrate it with uh, financial management as well. So you will see that um, when you look at it from a historical perspective, uh, risk management uh, was, uh, when you look at risk management for a particular business, it was basically uh, seen as a separate um, um, component or separate operation of the business compared to the other operations of the business as well. So over time, you will now see that um, they are now trying to integrate risk management and financial management. And they are also, you will see that later on uh, during the, uh, in our study material, we're going to be looking at the fusion between uh, risk management and also the financial market as well to see exactly how do we now make sure that we're able to uh, find ways of financing the different um, way, uh, do, how, how do we able to make sure that we're able to get the different financing that is needed for us to be able to what, to do the risk management what a uh, component of the business as well. So you see that over time there has been now progression in uh, creation of what securities which are now linking the insurance uh, side of the business and also the uh, financial markets as well. So that you're able to actually find out exactly how do you finance from an insurance perspective, uh, the financial uh, or financial or funding companies that needs to, needs to be, uh, that are needed for risk management purposes as well. So because of this, you will see that um, in study unit one, so the, for RSK 4803, um, we are going to be looking at um, six topics. So there are six topics that are going to be covering. Um, and uh, in the six topics that are going to be covering, you will see that um, in topic one, uh, for topic one, let me just quickly highlight the, the um, for topic one, we are going to be covering um, the three study units where we look at lessons not learned and where we look at the enterprise risk management and also where we look at capital in enterprises as well to see exactly. So how do we, uh, how, what are the different sources of capital for different enterprises as well? So when you look at study unit one, the main idea in study unit one is to see we are going to be looking at different case studies where risk management basically failed. So we're going to be looking at 
different case studies where they give us examples of case studies where risk management failed. So you will see that for study unit one, there are two. So for study unit uh, 1.1, so if you check on the study units that are going to be covering under study unit one, uh, on study unit one, uh, study unit one, uh, 1.1, we look at the case of ESCOM. And then on study unit 1.2, we are going to be looking at the case of uh, uh, Bearings Bank. Then on study unit 1.3, we look at HIH. Then um, on study unit 1.4, we look at the case study of what? Of COM A as well, right? So for these four study units, historically, we have never seen questions coming from these four study units because there's nothing, it's basically giving you historical examples of where cases where risk management, what? Failed as well. So which means that for study unit 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1 you can go through them to understand cases where risk management failed, but don't expect these four study units, these sections to come in the exam, because there is usually in the exam, it's either you, they give you a, part, a certain concept that they want you, they examine you on a certain concept, or they give you a given case study in the exam, and based on that case study, they ask you questions on, based on what the case study that would have been given in the exam. So because of this, it basically means that these four case studies are basically just examples that are used for you to be able to understand exactly cases where risk management failed, but it's not necessarily for the sake of to say, um, we are going to be expecting that this is going to be coming in the exam as well. You would not, I would not expect you to be examined on anything in the exam based on this, because it's just case studies that, which are from historical, uh, uh, from a historical background where risk management failed, but don't expect this to be uh, examinable as well. So study unit 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, just go over them, but it's not something that I would say is something that would be highly examinable. Mm -mm. Are there any questions regarding uh, this? I'm just going to brush through to give you a historical background of exactly where what is really happening in this case studies as well, but I'm not going to dwell too much time on these ones because it's not something that I would say we need to concentrate on for the exam. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? All right. Then you'll see that there is study unit 1.5. And study unit 1.5 looks at risk management failures. What are they and when do they happen? So in this case, they give us the case study of uh, LTCM. So apart from just looking at the case study uh, of analyzing the company itself, they go on further and also give us guidelines of exactly how, wh what are the, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, really, what really causes uh, risk management failures as well. And how you can also, potentially what look at how you can what um, um, diagnose the situation as well. So because of this, although study unit 1.5, we have never really seen it in the previous exam, but this one we're going to go through it so that in case it comes, we understand the, the, exactly how to be able to approach the question as well. So study unit 1.5, we are going to go through it in detail because just in case it comes in the future, at least you'll be knowing exactly how to approach those two questions as well. Those questions as well. Then there is also study unit 1.6. And study unit 1.6, they look at what a difference a word makes. And they look at understanding threats to performance in a VUCA world. So we are going to look at to see exactly, so what does the acronym VUCA mean? And exactly uh, how, how, how is it now applicable in the business world as well? So based on this, you are going to see that we are going to look at our study unit 1.6 in detail as well. But please take note, study unit 1.5 and study unit 1.6, we have never really seen the lecturer asking questions either in assignments or in past papers as well. The lecturer has not asked questions based on them, but we are going to go through them so that in case they bring these concepts as well, you will be able to understand exactly how to approach, approach this question. Because if they bring these questions, 
it will probably be uh, probably they'll bring a, that question as a, maybe a 10 mark or a maximum 15 mark type of question as well. So we need to understand exactly if the question is brought in the exam, how do you uh, go about to approach that question as well? So that's study unit, uh, study unit one. Study unit, so that's basically what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, so that's, those are the, un the units that are going to be looking at today. Study unit two looks at enterprise risk management. And uh, in the next class, that's when we're going to be looking at study unit two, but I don't think we'll be able to finish study unit one today because I don't wanna move too fast and disadvantage other students, especially when it comes to uh, study unit 1.5 and 1.6 as well. Probably today, we're going to look at 1.5, then in the next class, we'll look at 1.6, then we'll look at uh, study unit two as well. So, Study unit two looks at enterprise risk management. And when you look at enterprise risk management, we are now looking to see a situation where we say, historically, risk management has been seen as a separate component or separate department of the organization. But now we're trying to look at say, see exactly, how do you ensure that risk management department is now working hand in hand with other departments in the uh, organization? How is it working hand in hand with the operations department, uh, manufacturing department, with the finance department or and all these other departments that you find in the organization as well. Because remember, if you are going to be looking at risk management, you have to look at the risk management functions uh, and the, you know, we also have to look at analysis of the risk management, uh, management of the overall uh, organization, not only on certain components of the organization as well. So we now look to, need to see exactly how is risk management evolve, evolved historically so that we're now going to be able to look at the risk management function on, uh, where you are now look, look to say, how do we now, uh, how are we able to uh, analyze and understand risk management from, from the overall organ, organization point of view as well? So that's basically what we're going to be looking at study unit, study unit two. Study unit three, uh, study unit three looks at capital in enterprises. And when you look at capital in enterprises, we're basically saying, we know that historically, what we know as capital, as a sources of capital, we know that historically, capital has been made up of where we say, remember when you look at the accounting equation, your assets is equals to, so where, Uh, just give me a second. Uh, something's wrong with my network.
Uh, my apologies. Uh, usually with load shading, sometimes uh, something, the network sometimes goes down as well. Um, so what I was saying is, if you look at um, study unit three, the main idea behind study unit three is that we know that when you look at the accounting equation, we say your assets is equals to equity plus liabilities. So which means that we are basically saying to finance the assets of the business, our sources of capital, historically we have seen the source of capital being coming from equity, which is contribution from the owners of the business and liabilities, which is what um, uh, external financing. But now, since we are basically saying that we are now trying to fuse risk management and financial management as well, we are now going to say another component of uh, sources of financing is basically the risk capital component. And a typical example of a risk capital component is where we are now going to say, for example, if you are looking to finance um, the risk capital component is where you are now going to be going to what? The insurance route. So if you're going to be taking out an insurance uh, on your assets of a business, it basically means that it's another capital company that you're now going to be saying that to finance the assets of the business, in case of loss events as well, we need to make sure that we have insurance. So ensure that we're able to, what, to maximize the value of the firm. Because remember we say, so when you look at um, RISK 3 when you look at this financing, you always have to ask yourself this question, what is the goal of the firm? And the goal of the firm is to maximize shareholders' wealth. So the goal of the firm is to maximize shareholders' wealth. So how do we maximize shareholders' wealth? By ensuring that we're maximizing the returns from equity, we're maximizing the returns from liabilities. And also by ensuring that in case of a loss event, we have a risk component capital, a risk capital component in it to ensure that any losses that are going to be suffered from the from the any loss events from the asset, we're going to be able to ensure that what the insurance component of it is going to be uh, covering that as well. If you go the insurance route as well. So that's basically what we're going to be looking at and analyzing in study unit three. So are there any questions on what we're going to be looking at from study unit one, study unit two, and study unit three? Are there any questions? All right, so I'm, I've given you a more detailed breakdown of exactly what is what are we expected to cover when you look at study unit one, uh, 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 when you look at study unit one, study unit two, and study unit three. Because remember we said these are the three study units that are going to be finding under topic one. So under topic one, these are the three study units that are going to be looking at. Then, we're also going to be looking at topic two. And when you look at topic two, it looks at decision theory. So we look at decision theory on topic two. So when you look at topic two, we look at it from a historical philosophical perspective to say, how do you now make these, those decisions where you're trying to strike a balance between what is the best decision that are, uh, that are going to be uh, the best decision for the community, and how do you strike that uh, that balance between making decisions that are, remember we say the goal of the firm is to maximize shareholders' wealth. So how do you now just strike that, um, that balance between trying to maximize shareholders' wealth and also trying to make decisions that are uh, in the best interest of what? Of the community as well. So that's why you're now going to be looking at the philosophical context of what? Decision making. Then we're going to be looking at moral hazard and adverse selection. So when you look at moral hazard, we're looking at the actions. Remember, we said that as part of your, uh, as part of risk management, we're going to be looking at risk capital. Like for example, if you go the insurance route, right? So we're now going to be saying when you look at moral hazard, we're going to say, so what are the problems that can be encountered when one goes into an insurance contract as the insured, where they make decisions which are not necessarily going to be in the best interest of that of the insurer as well, or which are going to be disadvantaging the, the insurer as well. Because we know, like for example, we know that for example, if when you look at moral hazard, this is where it can be moral hazard ex post or ex ant as well, right? So which means that when you look at moral hazard ex ant, we're looking at the actions of the insured B 
before the loss event happens. Like for example, the insurance contract is taking effect, but before the loss event happens, what are the actions of the insured which now are going to end up disadvantaging what the insured? Like for example, if you know, because you know that you're insured, you are not going to, you like for example, you know, because you know that you're insured, you become negligent with your asset, knowing very well that in case of any loss event, the insurer is going to bear the cost. So which basically means that you are, these are actions that, that the insurer is taking, which are basically disadvantaging what the insurer as well. Then we look at moral hazard ex post. This is where we look at the actions of the insured uh, after the loss event has happened. Like for example, where the insured, instead of saying, um, I lost, I lost so much under the, when they're now trying to make the claim, they, in, they, instead of them honestly indicating exactly what they've lost, for example, they now end up what exaggerating how much the extent of the loss would be as well. Like for example, you know that you had a dent before on the other side, and now you had an accident and you bump the other side as well. Then you try to make it seem as if when the accident happened, you had an, uh, the loss event happened here on one side of the car, for example, but now you're trying to now include the other side that is not what that was uh, where the accident, where the loss event happened, but uh, where there was uh, there was a dent on it, but it was not necessarily included on the same uh, on the event that you're claiming on as well. So this is basically where you look at the issues of moral hazard, and when you look at adverse selection, this is where you now look at the issue of asymm asymmetrical information availability between the insured and the insurer. Like for example, when the contract is initially taken. The insured might not know the uh, the uh, might know more about the asset that is being insured than what than the insurer as well. So, which means when you look at adverse selection, this is where the insurer is now going to be insuring uh, insuring something that they otherwise would not have been have insured, or they are now having a situation where even when they are insuring a particular asset, they are not able to properly price the insurance contract mainly because they don't have what all the information available, they're not given the true extent or the true nature of the asset being insured as well. Then we are going to, then after this, we're going to look at utility theory. So which means that when you look at utility, this is basically, uh, I would look at it as a satisfaction that you get from the use of an asset or the avoidance of what unhappiness or anything that got causes unhappiness in what in the use of an asset as well. So in, in simple terms, that basically what they mean by what by utility. So we're now going to look at say exactly. We said that we're going to be maximize trying to maximize shareholders' wealth. So how do we ensure that we are now going to be able to link the concept of utility with maximizing what shareholders' wealth as well? Then on stage unit seven, we're going to be looking at decision making techniques. And uh, one decision making technique that we're going to be looking at for uh, risk financing is where you look at the net present value method to say how, uh, uh, what is the net present value and how do you ensure that you're able to maximize what the net present value? Because if you're able to maximize the net present value, you're able to maximize the shareholders' wealth as well. So that's basically what, what we're going to be looking at when we look at study unit two. Study unit three, we are going to be looking at risk financing concepts. So we're going to be looking at risk financing concepts. And the first risk financing concept that we're going to be looking at is the concept of cost of risk. And the concept of cost of risk is a highly examinable concept. So the, the reason why it's highly examinable is mainly because we there are different ways that they can, the lecturer can ask you questions in the exam based on this. The lecturer can ask you questions in the exam where you can look at calculation of the cost of risk itself to say, so what is the uh, cost of risk? So that you're able to now have a more detailed analysis to say, for example, if we are, if, if we are insured, are we underinsured? Are we overinsured? Or do, do which means that you're not trying to find out exactly. Do we remember when you look at risk? It's either when you look at the concept of risk, it's either you are going to choose two routes. It's either you are going to choose to retain the risk, or you are going to choose to transfer the risk. And one way of transferring the risk is where we said you are going to go the insurance route. So one way of transferring the risk is where you can go through the uh, insurance route. Then we are also going to look at 
and not other forms of risk transfer, which we refer to as uh, alternative risk transfer as well. So apart from going the insurance route, we're also going to look at other four ways of risk transfer, which we refer to as alternative risk transfer. So that's basically what we're going to be covering in the other study units. When you look at study unit, uh, I think it's 13, 14, and 15 as well. So now looking at the concept of risk. So when you look at the cost of risk, you're not going to say, you are trying to analyze to say, if we decide to retain the risk, how much of this risk are we retaining? So you're trying to find out exactly, if we decide to retain the risk, how much of the risk are we currently retaining? So you're going to look at it. In most cases, if they ask you to do the calculation of uh, uh, cost of risk, to, add, to, add, to, to calculate the cost of risk, because remember, when you look at the cost of risk, you're not going to say, what are the different, there are four different components that you're going to be looking at when you look at cost of risk. You can, you can look at the cost of risk from an insurance perspective, we well, can look at cost of risk from an unrealized uh, um, losses expenses. Uh, sorry, and you look at cost of risk from um, unreinvest losses to say when we suffered a loss, how much of these losses will we not be will we not able to recover from the insurance company if we insured, or how much of these losses did we end up retaining on our side as well? Then when you look at cost of risk, you're also going to be looking at the cost of administrative expenses. From what from a risk perspective as well then you are also going to look at uh the cost of risk from uh, a perspective where we are going to say um from the perspective where we are going to say if you are going to bring at the cost of risk um how much of uh how much of this risk is coming from risk control and loss prevention expenditure. So how much of our uh, cost of risk component is coming from risk control and loss prevention expenditure? Like for example, if you are now going to be um, uh, installing, like for example, as part of your risk control and loss prevention, if you're going to be having a security guard uh, on your premises, it's part of your risk control and loss prevention expenditure as well. So that will form part of your what? cost of risk as well. So that's basically how you analyze the cost of risk. So it means the idea is that's where you're not going to say, when you look at the component of risk, how much of the risk are we retaining? How much of the risk are we transferring? So now when you look at the risk that you're retaining, the main idea behind the cost of risk is trying to find out exactly, currently now on our entity, how much risk are we retaining? Then when you risk, retain this risk, two things are going to happen. It's either you retain the risk where you are now going to be retaining the risk, which is going to be unfunded. So you see that this study, study unit as well is going to be linked to, to study unit 11 as well, where we are going to be looking at this uh, risk retention in detail as well. Then how much of this risk is going to be funded? So when you look at retained unfunded risk, this is where you're now going to say, from the retained unfunded risk, um, are we, when it's, okay, let's start with funded risk. When you look at funded risk, this is where you're not saying you are retaining the risk. You're not going to insurance good, but you're retaining the risk. But as you are retaining the risk, are you setting aside a, a reserve towards what? In case the loss event happened, you have money available to what? To meet the cost of that, of the loss event, of the losses as well. So this is where the risk retention becomes what? Funded. Then you're also going to say, if in, in case of a loss event, if it's unfunded, it basically means that you're saying that if the losses do materialize from a loss event, we are saying that we are going to absorb it as part of what? Operating expenditure as well. So that's basically how you are now going to be looking at the what? Retained risk. So when you look at the cost of risk, you are trying to analyze that to say, uh, how do we have the capacity to ensure that if we retain the risk, we're able to actually have uh, to find ways of actually what mitigating the cost of those losses as well. Because remember, if you decide to retain the risk and it's unfunded and you don't have a plan in place to actually meet the cost of the losses when they do happen, what is going to happen? It means that if, like for example, there's going to be a flood or there's going to be uh, there's going to be uh, if, it's a, it's, if it's if it's an accident, there's going to be an accident. It basically means that if it's retained and it's unfunded, what is going to happen? You are going to have a situation where 
your asset now can't move like for example if it's a vehicle you choose not to go the insurance route you decide to retain the risk but you're not putting aside any money in your uh, in your savings account or in any uh, investment account as well to ensure that in case the loss event happened so it basically means that if the loss if you get involved in an accident you're now having a situation where the mechanic is saying to fix this car we need sixty thousand, but at the same time you have retained the risk you don't have a fund available you are if you are unfunded but you, you know you are not even able to absorb that six thousand as part of your operating expenses expenditure as well which means that the problem there is that you're not going to be a situation where you're not going to be able to continue operating and if you're not able to continue operating it does when it ends up affecting what what we said initially what is the goal of the firm the goal of the firm is to maximize shareholders well which means that if you're not going to be able to have a situation where your asset if it's a the asset that you're having it let's, let's say for example you're running a delivery company and your vehicle get involved in an accident and you don't have a plan in place to actually what meet the cost to repair this vehicle then what could you're not able to continue operations which means that you're not going to have a situation where you're losing out on sales and you if you're losing out on sales in the short run you're losing out on profitability and in the long run you're not able to maximize the health as well so that's basically where the cost of risk so you will see that the cost of risk chapter is very much uh, the cost of risk study unit is very much linked to the uh, the issue of um um the issue of uh study unit 11 will be done looking to say so if you just go the risk retention route uh what are you expecting to happen and how do you ensure that you're able to what what mitigate the effects of the loss events when they happen as well so that's basically where the cost of uh, risk component comes in are there any questions Now, study unit nine, it looks at risk appetite and optimization under budget constraints. So when you look at risk appetite and optimization under budget constraints, remember here we said, when it comes to the issue of risk, it's either you're going to choose to retain the risk or you're going to choose to transfer the risk. So which means, if you have a high risk appetite, you are going to go more on the risk retention route. And if you have a low risk appetite, you are going to choose to go the risk transfer route. Like for example, if you have a high risk appetite, this is what you're saying, in case of a loss event, we don't have insurance policy available or any method of what transfer the risk, the risk as well. So which means that in case a loss event happened, we're going to make a plan on our side to, what, to absorb those losses on our side as well. And if you have a low risk appetite, this is where I'm saying that in case a loss event happened, we want to ensure that someone else is going to bear the cost of that loss. So this is where you go to what? The insurance route as well. Now, there is also cases where you are now finding yourself between risk retention and risk transfer. So there are examples where you can now be able to now, instead of being uh, having uh, two risk averse, where you are having a low risk appetite, or being uh, 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 two risk seeking, where you are now having a, a high risk appetite. If you want to find yourself somewhere in between here, there are different methods of finding yourself in between. Like for example, if you look at the case of what? Uh, the issue of deductibles. So if you look at the issue of deductibles. So when you look at the case of deductibles, this is where you're now saying that deductibles, it's in, from a South African insurance perspective, is basically what we refer to as excess. Like, like for example, if you look at car insurance. So the excess, is where now we say, for example, if you have uh, an excess of three thousand on your kind uh, on your vehicle, or you have an excess of let's say five thousand on your vehicle as well, it basically means that uh, in a, in simple terms, when it comes to excess, it basically means that if it's three thousand excess, it means that for in case of a loss event, it means the first three thousand of the loss 
you are going to absorb that cost. Then any, any loss over and above 3,000, it means that the insurer is going to cover you as well. So which means the higher the excess amount on your insurance policy, the lower the insurance premiums. So the higher the excess amount on your insurance policy, the lower the insurance premium. But also the higher the excess amount on insurance policy, the more risk you are retaining as well. Because remember, if it basically means that if the excess is 10,000, it means you are retaining more risk because you have to wait until the loss event is now exceeding what? 8,000 for you to be able to get anything, uh, 10,000 for you to be able to get anything from the, insurer, from the insurer as well. It basically means that you are bearing that, that cost. So which means that the higher the excess, the more the risk you are retaining. But we also know the higher the excess, the lower the premiums are going to be paying on insurance policy as well. So you're trying to now, this is where we are now saying that you are trying to have a balance between risk, appetite, and optimization under budget constraints. Because we know that under budgetary constraints, remember we said the higher the excess, the lower the premiums as well. So the reason why you might end up choosing the higher, uh, the higher excess amount is mainly because you might not be able to afford the amount that is needed if you're going to go the more comprehensive insurance route as well. So are we on the same page when it comes to topic three before you look at subunit 10? Are we on the same page? Any questions? So the reason why I'm giving you this overview is mainly because for risk financing, many students, they find it difficult to approach uh, the exam when it comes to risk financing, mainly because the lecturer is different. How they ask questions at honors level is different from how they ask questions at undergrad level. At undergrad level, you are looking, you have less case studies. You are answering questions basically based on, based on what? Short questions. Yes, at honors level, you find short questions, but un, under normal circumstances, the majority of the time in the exam, you are going to be have, expecting at least one or sometimes even two case studies as well. And when they bring you those questions based on the case study, it's not necessarily that they're going to be asking you questions on one concept. They are trying to now mash up different concepts to say, do you understand exactly why you covered the topics that you covered? Do you understand why you covered the different study units that you covered as well? So for you to be able to understand all that and put it all together, you will need to understand exactly why are we going through study unit one all the way to study unit what? 24 as well. The reason why we're doing that is mainly because they are basically leading on to one thing after the other based on the blueprint of risk financing to say, we're not trying to find the infusion between risk management functions and uh, finance functions as well. When you, when you look at financing function, you're looking at to say, uh, how do we now look at the crypto market? Uh, capital markets from the financing perspective to try to fuse between the two, uh, the financial markets and the risk management functions as well. So you need to understand exactly why you're doing what you're doing and exactly how these different study units are actually what linking together as well. So study unit 10 tries to give you an overview of risk financing. So study unit 10, tries to give you an overview of risk financing because it's now trying to show you a summary of how this concept that you've looked at so far, how are they mixing together? So we are trying to check to see all these concepts that we've seen so far, how are they mixing? Then after that, we are now going to now go, go forward and say, so now that we've understood how this concept mixed together as well, 
how do we now analyze in detail the risk retention? So when you now look at analysis of the risk retention in detail, this is where you're now going to be looking at topic uh, four. So topic four, this is where we are now going to be looking at risk retention. So you're now going to say on topic four, how do you now check your capacity to achieve the risk retention? Whether you go the unfunded route or you go the funded route, how do you ensure that you do have the capacity to achieve this risk retention? So that's basically what you're going to be covering in topic four, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in which is basically study unit 11. So in study unit 11, we're now going to analyze risk retention in detail and how do you check your organization to ensure that you do have the capacity to go the risk retention route because remember as an organization if you don't have the capacity to go the risk retention route it means automatically you have to go the risk transfer route like for example through the insurance route Then we also look at contingent capital. Now, when you look at contingent capital, we're basically saying, now, in a way, you are now trying to find yourself. Remember we say, yeah, remember we said, if either you fully retain the risk or you transfer the risk. So if either you fully retain the risk or you transfer the risk. So which means study unit 11, we are, we are going to analyze to say, how do you check the capacity to ensure that you do have the capacity to retain the risk? Because remember, if you don't have the capacity to retain the risk and you don't have a plan in place to retain the risk, then you have to go the risk transfer route as well. So how do you study unit 11? We look to see uh, and analyze to see exactly how do you check the company's capacity or the organization's capacity to do risk retention. But now there are some cases where you are not trying to find yourself more on the uh, hybrid route where you're not saying, we are not fully retaining the risk, but there is a some level of what risk transfer, although we are retaining the risk. So although we are retaining the risk, how do we ensure that there is some sort of arrangement available that we're able to buy time by transferring some of the risk, although we are retaining the risk. So this is where we're now going to be looking at what? The first one being what? Contingent capital. Because when you look at contingent capital, this is basically where you're saying that this is where you make an arrangement uh, usually with the financial institution to say, you indicate to them that, that in case this loss event happen, you can, can you give me a guarantee that you're going to be able to give me financing? So yeah, so it's more like having a situation where you are making arrangement before the loss event happens to say, can you please uh, give me guarantees that in case uh, a certain loss event happens, uh, when I want financing, they're going to make the financing available to me. So which means when you look at contingent capital, in a way you are sort of transferring the risk, but not necessarily transferring the risk, but you're getting more, it's, it's, it's an alternative risk transfer route, but you're not necessarily transferring the risk per se to the other party, but you're getting some sort of guarantee that they give you the money, although you're now going to be owing them the money, depending on the type of uh, risk financing, whether you're now going to make that arrangement to say, are you going to give me that guarantee to say, you're going to finance me through either, either equity or debt financing. So which means you are now making an arrangement that you are not going to say, I'm going to be 100% solely being be the one who's going to be making an arrangement to get the financing available that is needed. But you're now saying, I just need some sort of guarantee to say, in case the loss event happens, I have some money that I can be able to access. Right? So that's basically, so we're going to look at the different forms and the different ways in which you cannot go into 
contingent capital or, or you can be able to access contingent capital. Then we're also going to look at finite insurance. So we're now going to look at the different ways that you can be able to access finite insurance. So with finite insurance, it's more like a hybrid between risk retention and risk transfer. So finite insurance contracts, they are different from the commercial insurance route because with the commercial insurance route, the insurance, you when you want insurance, the insurance company, um, um, you, uh, uh, you do your application, the insurance company does the assessment and then uh, they just give you to say, based, we are putting you in this category and the clients in this category, category basically we are going to, this is how much um, they do the covering and then they say, this is how much insurance they have to pay. So with finite insurance route, you are trying to customize or to reach a customized or to come up with a customized insurance product that you are now going to negotiate with the insurance company. So with this customized insurance product, you are now going to say, I'm trying to find myself between risk retention and risk transfer, but I want to be able to control how much risk am I retaining and how much risk am I transferring? So which means these are the different forms that are going to be looking at when you look at finite risk insurance. So when you come to finite insurance, you are now the unique thing about finite insurance is that you are now having some sort of customized insurance arrangement where you are retaining the risk depending on exactly what your risk appetite is and you're transferring some of the risk as well. So the unique thing about finite insurance is that you are having a situation where you are now having a non-standard insurance arrangement with what? With insurance. So which means with the insurance company. So which means in your insurance contract, it basically means that you are now going to have some sort of risk retention and also some sort of what? Risk transfer as well. So that's the unique thing about finite insurance. So the unique thing there, the most important thing that makes it different from the other type of arrangement is that this one, you are having a customized type of what? Insurance arrangement because you want to be in control of how, what risk components are you retaining and what risk components are going to be transferring, depending on exactly what are the different ways that you can be able to structure that. And we're going to be looking at that as well. Then from there, we look at captive insurance. So when you look at captive insurance, this is where you are entering into an insurance arrangement. So you're entering into an insurance arrangement, uh, but now, this insurance arrangement, you are saying, you know what? Instead of us going the commercial insurance route, you get, the problem there with the commercial insurance route is that the insurance contracts, the insur insurance market can have periods where there is uh, the market, there is where what we call the soft market and the hard market as well. So you have so which means basically means that in simple terms, there are periods where remember you are being put in a particular pot of clients, right? So which means you are being put in a particular category of clients. So which means that because you're being put in a particular category of clients and not necessarily that you are having a situation where they are under analyzing you as an individual client. So which means that because you're being put in a particular pot of clients, it basically means that depending on exactly what is happening in the market, there can be periods where you are having a situation where your loss experience is low, your loss experience is low, but at the same time, or the loss experience has been very constant or stable, and your loss experience is low, but at the same time, you find a situation where you are now paying a lot more in insurance premiums because of what's happening in the market. And now you're having a situation where you are, you are feeling like you're paying a lot more in insurance, but still your loss experience is low, and your, 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 your loss experience is low, and your claims are basically lower as well and have been stable over time. So you are now seeing that you are being disadvantaged. 
So what does, so where captive insurance comes in is we are now going to say, you know what, instead of us going the commercial insurance route, why don't we create our own subsidiary, which is an insurance company that is going, whose uh, main mandate is to insure me as the parent company. So what usually happens is that when you look at captive insurance, you usually find these arrangements with the bigger companies as well. Like for example, it can be uh, a couple of big companies. So because it's a couple of big companies, they, are, they know that they are able to raise the funding needed to finance this insurance company that they're going to be creating. And because of this, because they know that they're able to now put their money together in one pot and insure them, themselves as well. And remember this uh, captive insurance company as well. It's an insurance company that whose main mandate is basically to insure the parent companies, but it can also be, uh, be able to insure other people who run as an insurance company that is able to insure other parties as well and also create a profit as well. So because of this, when you now look at the captive insurance route, we're basically saying that you don't want to go the uh, commercial insurance route because you feel like you're being paid, you're paying too much compared to your loss experience. You're not claiming that much. Your loss experience has been stable, but at the same time, you feel like you're paying too much when you go the commercial insurance route. So what can you do? You now can come up uh, on your own or either as a um, group of companies, you now create your own insurance company. So this insurance company that you're creating is what you are referring to as the uh, captive insurance company, whose mandate is to now ensure the risk of the parent companies, which is basically the group of what? Parent companies. Because they know that if they put their funding together and fund this captive insurance company, it basically means that in case of loss event, this captive insurance company will now be able to actually what? meet the losses of these insurance companies, of these uh, parent companies as well when they do happen. But usually, ideally, ideally, you would want to create a go the captive insurance route, or even uh, you want to go the captive insurance route where you know that your loss experiences are, what? are lower because it means that the loss events are manageable, which means that the captive insurance company would be having the capacity to meet the cost of these losses when they do happen as well. So is there any question regarding uh, contingent, finite, and captive uh, uh, insurance as well? Any questions? Now, moving on to topic five. Topic five looks at, uh, topic five looks at um, study unit 15 to study unit 22. So topic five looks at study unit 15 to 22. Study unit 15, looks at insurance as a risk transfer mechanism. And study unit 16 looks at the overview of the commercial insurance as well. So now of the, in topic five, although we're given all these study units, the most important study units that you need to make sure that you take note of the is study unit 15, study unit 16, and business interruption. These are the three that you need to look at. So, remember we say, when it comes to risk, you can either choose to retain the risk. You can look at alternative risk transfer methods where you're not necessarily going the full transfer of risk by going the commercial insurance route, where we now look at the different methods that you can now go about alternatively transferring the risk. Then now we're going to say, okay, fine. 
if you're going to be outright transferring the risk, what method is available? And this is why we are now looking at what? At um, the commercial insurance route as well. So when you look at insurance at risk, risk uh, transfer mechanism, and where you look, when we also look at the overview of commercial insurance as well, uh, this is where I'm going to say, if you're going to go the full risk transfer route and you go the commercial insurance route, what can you expect? And what, uh, what, are, what, are the different, um, what are the different ways that you can also go into what? The commercial insurance route as well. So which means it's a risk transfer mechanism that is available. We are now choosing between risk retention and risk transfer as well. So one way is through the commercial insurance code. So you will see that when it comes to this study unit, there are certain sections which are very, very important that you need to make sure that you uh, go through and take note as well, because they can be asked as your questions. Now, we are also going to look at these. So study unit, where you look at property insurance, motor insurance, liability insurance, and group of uh, personal accident uh, stated benefits and also the underwriting information technology risk as well. These study units, historically, the lecturer has never really emphasized on those study units. There is ne the, he has never asked anything in the assignment or even in the past exams. He has never really, I remember when the, uh, the curriculum changed, when we we're preparing for the exams, he specifically asked us not to uh, worry much about uh, when it comes to topic five, he just he specifically asked us to look at this and also business interruption as well. So, which means when we go through these different study units, we're not going to even spend time and waste time looking at these other ones. Yes, these are the different forms that you can go into when you go the insurance route, but we would not expect the lecturer to be asking you questions based on these different study units as well. And because of that, we are not going to go through them. If you can go through them on your own, the better, but we're not going to dwell too much on them because historically, the lecture has never really emphasized on them. Over the, I think it's been since 2000, uh, uh, since 2018, when the curriculum changed, the lecture has never asked questions based on this. I remember over the years, when we now, when you look at the topics that we need to prepare for the exam, yes, it is these ones that have never been any one of the to, uh, topics that we need to prepare for the exam. So because of this, we don't worry or spend time or go through the even go through them when we go through the curriculum as well because I don't see the point of going through them. If there's considering that there's no material that the lecturer emphasizes on when it comes to preparing for the exam as well. Now, when it comes to study unit twenty one. It's a very important study unit, and it's also a highly examinable study unit. It's, sometimes they can bring this as a calculation-based question, and sometimes they can bring this as a theory-based question, uh, for theory-based questions as well. So now when you look at business interruption insurance, this is where we're saying, when you look at uh, an organization, or an entity having suffered a loss, right? When you look at it, an organization or an entity having suffered a loss, they can be insured on their property or the motor, they can be having a property insurance, they can be having a motor insurance, they can be having a liability insurance, or they can be having a group personal accident and state benefits insurance, or they can be even having what? Insurance on the what? Uh, uh, IT systems as well. But now, where business interruption insurance comes in being very important is what we're now going to say. These are the forms of insurance. So when you suffer a loss event, right? So when you suffer a loss event, uh, let me just give you as a typical, I remember from study unit eight, there is an article that uh, the way they explain this article is very much interesting because it gives you a, an overall bigger picture of exactly what really happens when one suffers a loss as well.
So you see that um, we look at the hidden cost of an accident. And normally, we are going to be insured, for, for example, in injury, ill health, or damage. But then there are these other uninsured costs, like, for example, production delays, legal costs, investigation time, fines, or loss of experience or expertise as well. So what do we see? Do you see that what the cost of what your insurance or what the insurance company is going to be paying you is more like an iceberg where when you see from the top, it's just this small part, but at the bottom, there are even bigger costs that are going to be incurring as well. So because of this, where the business interruption insurance comes in is where we're basically trying to uh, highlight a very important concept where we're saying, yes, you can be having motor insurance, property insurance or liability insurance, but now what happens? So what happens after the loss event? Yes, let's say for example, you have insured your building that you're going to be working from or operating from. A fire gutters down the building. The insurance company says, okay, how much is the building worth? Uh, your property insurance and uh, the building is worth a mil, uh, let's say the building is worth 2 million. And then the insurance company says, okay, fine. Your building is worth 2 million. So we're going to pay you the 2 million. But what do we know? If the fire happens now, the insurance company still needs to do the assessment. They need to do their due diligence. Then eventually they pay you that 2 million. And then when they pay you that 2 million, you're now going to have a situation where maybe now you have to now start renovating and changing things and fixing the building as well. So you're going to end up losing out on potential profitability that you would have, that you are going to be losing out on. So which basically means that you're now going to have a situation where you might end up losing out on key, ex, key expertise in your organization because the organization is able to, what, to continue running and there's no com money coming in. You're now, and you're now having a situation where there's no money coming in. You're now having liquidity issues while you're still build, uh, uh, fixing the building as well for you to now go back and what, start operating. So this is where business insurance comes in. We are now going to say with business interruption insurance, you are now going to now try to go over and above these normal insurance policies that you have to say, if you are now going to be, if there's going to be any business interruption, how do we now, uh, how are we now going to be able to ensure that what? We are not losing out on gross profits that we should be generating for us to be able to what? To meet these other costs, which are always what we're expecting to what? To continue incurring as well as part of our day-to-day -day operations. To ensure that if we are going to be business interruption, you can say employees can work from home, for example, but at the same time, we should be able to meet the expenses. We can say this is what we're going to be incurring and meet those expenses while with the business, what is uh, not able to fully operate or while we're having what a downtime as well. So this is where business interruption insurance comes in. So, so which means when it comes to business interruption insurance, you need to find out exactly uh, how much how do you calculate or how do you do the calculation of the claim that you can be able to make from the insurer? And how do you do the calculation of the amount of coverage that, that you need as well, specifically for what? For business interruption. So that's what we're going to be looking at when you look at the business interruption insurance as well. So we need to be able to do the calculations and understand exactly how do we do the calculations and how do we ensure that we are able to meet those, uh, have uh, a, a coverage available to meet those expenses and guess what? The lost events do happen as well. Then, um, so that's topic five. Then topic six looks at risk management by insurers. And it also, then it also looks at risk uh, insurance leaked securities. So topic, so start unit 23, we are now going to look to say, how do we look at the risk management from an insurer, from the, uh, ins from insurer's perspective as well? And here, we're now going to say, the main thing that we're going to be looking at is that, remember we said, historically, 
from, an from the insurer's perspective, we have this type of relationship. So historically, from an insurer's perspective, we have the insured here, and then we have the insurer. I'll, I'll call this primary insurer, right? Then we also have the reinsurer as well, right? So, which means when you look at the relationship, the insured transact with the primary insurer, right? But now, historically, we had a situation where now the primary insurer is saying, you know what, I might not have enough money available or funding available to meet the cost of the claim for the insurer. In case the insurer claims, I might not have the means available to, what, to meet that cost in case of a claim. So what, can, what do they do? They, uh, they approach the reinsurer and they enter into a contract where they can be transferring some of the risk at a cost to the reinsurer. So they're going to be ceding some of the risk to the reinsurer as well. So historically, so which means as a way of raising money, the primary insurer was able to either raise money internally through equity and liabilities, but now, as a way of also spreading or diversifying their risk, they go the reinsurance route, right? As they go the reinsurance route, what do we see? It basically means that the reinsurer historically have been limited to get money either from equity and liabilities. So this one is trying to diversify their risk by spreading some of that risk to the reinsurer as well. Now, remember we said, from study unit one, we said, when you look at this financing, you are trying to look at the fusion between the insurance market, which is the uh, risk management side, and also the capital markets, which is basically the financing side as well. So which means now, over time, there's been developed developments in the markets where instead of just uh, looking at these, or this one as the, source of a uh, way of diversifying the risk as well. Either the primary insurer or the reinsurer as well, they can create what we call a special purpose vehicle. And this special purpose vehicle can now be able to issue securities in the capital market. So they can be able to issue securities in the capital market so that, why are we looking at the capital market? Because we know that the money being contributed either from equity and liability of the company, which is the internal funding there, might not be enough to cover the costs of, of the claims that can be made. Because remember, this insurer is not going to be only having one client. They can be having a lot of clients as well. And in case of, of uh, catastrophic losses, like for example, we have seen cases where, if you look at last year, there was those looting of, uh, of, uh, of um, of uh, of um, the malls and all those other um, and all those other businesses as well, which means that insurance companies now, if they were to, because of those catastrophic losses, like for example, if there's going to be, let's say, there's going to be floods or any of those natural disasters as well, in case of those catastrophic losses, the funding that might be available internally from either the primary insurer or the insurer might not be enough to meet the cost of these catastrophic losses. So in the case of catastrophic losses, it means now the other way there's a fusion between the insurance market and the capital market is where now they are trying to merge them together by creation of the special papers vehicle whose main mandate is to be able to access the capital market. So if, when they now issue securities to access the capital market, the securities that they can issue to access the capital markets, for example, is what we call, for example, we, uh, one way is through issuing what we call cat bonds or catastrophic bonds. So with these cat bonds, they are issued uh, with the uh, way we are, say, we are saying, the special purpose vehicle pays a premium to the investors in the capital market, and then now, in case of a loss event, remember the special, now in, uh, in exchange, the investors in the crypto market, they give a certain uh, amount or well, the power value of the bonds to what? 
to the special purpose vehicle. Then in case of a loss event, that power value is what is going to be going down to the primary insurance or in case of a loss event. If the loss event doesn't happen, they get back their money, but they would have also end what? A premium that they would have ended as a return on their money as well. But in case of a loss event, the power value now goes to the primary insurer so that they're able what? to meet the cost of these claims from the insurer, from the insured as well. So study unit 23 is trying to show you that link to say, so how is how do insurers manage their risk as well? Traditionally, insurers have been managing their risk by going the reinsurance route. But we're saying it's not enough. The claims that are being made because of uh, these catastrophic events that are also increasing uh, uh, in happening as well, it basically means that the, that's why we're now having a fusion between the uh, the insurance, uh, the insurers, and the capital market by creation of what special purpose vehicles whose sole mandate is to issue securities, which are able to issue securities in the capital market, which are used to finance. So they'll be able to issue securities in the capital markets, which are now going to be used what? to finance the claims in case of what? Of a loss event. So that's what we're going to be looking at in study unit 23. So do you see that there is a blueprint that you are basically following and that you need to understand how everything links together when it comes to risk financing. So there's a blueprint that you need to understand on exactly how everything links together when it comes to risk financing. Then study unit 24 looks at insurance linked securities. Now, remember we said there is a link between the capital market and the insurance, isn't it? So we said there is a link between the capital market and insurance uh, market as well. So how do we, so study unit 24, we are now going to be looking at and analyzing what are these insurance securities which are linked to insurance, which are going to be issued in the capital markets. So we're going to look at what are the different examples of these insurance linked securities, which are basically issued in the capital markets by the special by the special purpose vehicles so that they're able to, what, to be used as source of fin financing for, what, for the insurance market, for the insurers as well. So that in case of loss events, they're able to meet the claims by the what? By the insurer. So we're now going to be looking at uh, the different insurance linked securities. And we're also going to be looking at to see exactly, so when does each security that that is, uh, how does each security, wh what is, what, what constitute a trigger event for each what security is, or to say, what constitutes to say, now the payment must be made to the primary, uh, to the, either the primary insurer or the reinsurer for them to be able to access that money. So what conditions need to be met for the money now to flow down to the, uh, to the insurance, uh, to the insurers as well, whether it's the primary insurer or the reinsurer as well. So that's basically what we're going to be analyzing in study unit 24. So do you see that topic one, topic two, topic three, topic four, topic five, and topic six, they are intertwined. And for you to be able to understand why we are doing what we're doing in all these topics, you also need to be able to have a good understanding of exactly how are they intertwined, what is the ultimate aim, and why are we going through each study unit and how does each study unit contribute towards what? The ultimate aim. And remember, the ultimate aim goes back to say, what is the goal of the firm? The goal of the firm is to maximize shareholders' wealth. So now, how do we ensure that we're able to maximize shareholders' wealth? And the main thing is, when you're not, not trying to maximize shareholders' wealth, when it comes to risk management, you have two options. Either you retain the risk or you transfer the risk. If you choose to return to the risk, what are you expecting to encounter if you choose to return the risk? If you choose to transfer the risk, what are you expecting to encounter if you transfer the risk? If you choose a hybrid between 
risk retention in or risk transfer, when we look at alternative risk transfer, uh, um, uh, transfer methods, we are now going to say, so what are the different examples of alternative risk transfer methods? And, or, and what are the different products that you also find under alternative risk transfer? And how are they made up? And how do you now determine to say, this product is basically what I need for me to be able to, uh, uh, depending on the, on the what? On the needs of the organization. But remember, the risk retention decision and the risk transfer decision is based on your risk appetite. Do you have a high risk appetite or do you have a low risk appetite? So do you now have a better understanding of the blueprint of what we are expected to do when it comes to risk financing? Are there any questions there? Uh, uh, Harinus. Yes. Um, I'm just, I just want some clarity there. You've got like the study unit or the mm -hmm. study material that you are using. It's a bit misaligned to what we have now. For the oh yeah, I noticed that. I think I needed to update the, is it study unit? Uh, I think it's study unit five, is it? Yeah, for example, topic five and topic six. We, we yeah, like on topic, topic five. Six we've got. Uh, let me check. Let me check quickly. Um, topic five. I saw that uh, topic five was later and updated the study guide. Uh, I think it was last year. Let me just quickly check. I need to just quickly download the, the latest one. Uh, um, Just give me a second. I just want to ask someone to send me the, the study, the study guides. Okay, topic five. I've got them with me, Renas. If you want, I can drop them in your inbox. I, can... no, no, I have them. I, I have them. Okay. Uh, I asked someone to, I just need to quickly download them because I have them on my email. Okay. Uh, let me just quickly check now. Because I remember the lecturer uh, is constantly updating because I remember in the previous um, study guides, the topic five and six was made up of uh, a lot of things that no, were not necessarily we needed to cover as well. So he streamlined them. Uh, it's topic five and topic six as well. Okay. Oh yes, topic five. It's, it's streamlined as this, isn't it? Topic five is uh, you have studied unit 15, then 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22, right? Yeah. That's what you have, isn't it? So you yeah. see that on these study unit, um, where I was talking about study unit, um, Where I was looking at study unit 15 to, uh, to 22 there, right? Remember I said uh, insurance and risk transfer mechanism overview of commercial insurance. So what the lecturer has done is that he has streamlined those two study units into one where you look at what overview of commercial insurance. So he has basically uh, uh, streamlined them into one study unit. So that's basically what he has done. So instead of having those two study units is basically uh, removed unnecess unnecessary information and streamlined them into one study unit. So that's so you will see that the material that you find previously in study unit 15 and 16 is basically found under the overview of commercial insurance. So it's basically uh, summing, uh, summing them up together as well. Then property insurance, motor in, uh, insurance, liability insurance, group personal accidents, and underwriting and negotiating insurance cover as well. You need to know these from a practical perspective but from, a, from the case of um, examinations, 
he has never really emphasized this. You see that because you, what the lecturer usually does is that uh, sometime in December, he will give you a guideline to say uh, from topic one to topic six uh, for the exam, please take note of these 30 minutes. And we have seen the study that he, that it he gives us. And in most cases, he never really, he has never covered these ones. Uh, the ones that I've said, they're not really that much important. So in case this year he changes them, maybe we might have to cover them, but I highly doubt that we will need to cover those ones. So initially when we go through the curriculum, we're not going to cover them. Then when he gives us that guideline to, to, for topics to prepare for the exam, if he brings it, then we'll quickly go through them so that I highlight what is needed there. But I don't want to waste, because remember, it's a lot of set units that you need to make sure that you cover as well. So we try as much as possible to do away with things that we deem to be and not necessarily needed for the exam as well. So you see that here, study unit 15 and study unit 20, which looks at business interruption insurance, highly examinable. Take note of them, they are highly, examinable. Are we on the same page? Are there any questions? Yes, there? we are. All right. Are there any questions? So for topic six, that will be a similar principle. Um, yes. Topic six. Let me quickly have a look at topic six. So yes. This one line. Okay. So topic six is, no, okay. So what he has done is last year, we had unit 24 and unit uh, 23, unit 23 and unit 24, where you look at risk management by insurance, insurance linked securities as well. So if you look at uh, uh, study unit 23, let me just quickly brush through it. Yes. So what he has done is previously topic six was having a lot of, let me just give you a typical example of what you would find in topic six when you look at um, over the previous years. Uh, RSQ 503, study guides, 2018, topic six. So you see that historically for topic six, uh, if you look at when, when the curriculum changed, historically for topic six, we had risk management by insurers and we had um, uh, securitization and crypto market instruments as well. There was a lot of articles that the lecturer was just summing up together. It was, it was a lot of articles that you, the lecturer was giving us, but most of these articles were not necessarily relevant for us to prepare for the exam. And some of them were like re repetition of the same concepts which you brought in over and over again as well. So when it comes to topic five and topic six, you will see that over time, the lecture is changing because it's now trying to streamline them because there was a lot of reputation and a lot of unnecessary information as well. So what the lecture is trying to do is that he's trying to streamline them so that he does away with articles where there's a lot of repetition or unnecessary information so that we are only dealing with what is needed to be covered for what the uh, outcome or what you are expected to know as an uh, topic outcome as well. So because of that, you see that when it comes to topic five, uh, topic six as well, uh, for the current year, he has basically streamlined them. And when he streamlined them, or when he does the streamlining, it basically means topic 23 and to topic 24, He's merging them together, but as he's merging them together, he's taking out some of the information and bringing, it, uh, he's taking out some of the information and merging them together so that what it makes a bit of sense when it comes to uh, what the topic outcome would be as well. So topic five and topic six, over time, the lecturer is what streamlining them. So that's why you see that even over time, topic five, uh, topic five as well, is there's a lot of information that well, there's concepts that yes we need to know them from uh, from a practical perspective when you're in the industry but you see that because of the amount of work that we need to do as well 
he, he doesn't really emphasize most of the topics that you find in topic five, mainly because you need to know them for practical purposes, but not necessarily for the exam. So that's why you see that topic five and six, there's always going to be some changes that are made over time as well. Expect those changes because the, the lecturer is trying to streamline them so that they make sense over at the end of the day as well. So are we on the same page? But remember, if you look at topic six, what the lecturer is, okay, where is topic six? If you look at topic six, it looks at insurance linked securities. Remember when I gave you the over, I said, historically, we need, we, we're going the reinsurance route. So the main idea behind topic six is to demonstrate the link between the insurance market and the capital market. So because the ultimate aim is to show the link between the insurance market and the capital market as a way of fusing them together, because they're basically saying over time, in historically, or historically we've seen that the capital market has operated on its own, the insurance market has operated on its own as well. Now we're having where there's now a, 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 a merging of these two together as well. And how are they linked together? Through the issue of insurance linked securities. So the insurance linked securities are used as a way of financing the claims from loss events. So instead of just relying on equity and liability from the primary insurer, from the primary insurer or insurer of getting going the insurance route as a way of what managing risk as well for the primary insurer, they can now go into the they have another source of financing, which is basically the capital market. So study unit 23 is just demonstrating this linkage between the two to say, so how are we linking the insurance market and the capital markets? And what are the instruments that we're using to link the insurance market? in the capital market so that we're able to say, instead of being limited to only being able to get equity and liabilities, in case of catastrophic losses or catastrophic, catastrophic events as well, how do we ensure that we're able to meet the, uh, the capital needed to meet the claims from catastrophic events as well? Because even if you look at it, if you look at insurance companies, if you look at their balance sheet, if you look at their equity and liabilities and the money that they have on their balance sheet, if we look at the rise that happened last year, the insurance companies would have struggled to meet the cost of the claims. So one way that they can now be able to meet the cost of these claims is where they are having insurance linked securities because the insurance linked securities, because we know that the capital market is way much bigger than the insurance market. It's a lot bigger because the insurance market is only its uh, source of funding is only limited to the equity and liabilities from what? From the insurance companies themselves. So which means when you're now looking at the source of funding now, if you now link the capital markets and the insurance market, if you link them together, it means that the insurance company is now going, insurance companies are able to now have access to the capital market where it, they are able to have access to a bigger source of financing than a smaller source of financing that is purely from their own side as well. So that's why we see that this link of the two, the reason why they are link linking them together is because we want to be able to meet the cost of these claims in case of loss events. So in case of loss events, we need to be able to meet the cost of these claims by able, being able to access the capital market because the, from the capital markets, there is more money that they can be able to access than just relying on the insurance market as a source of capital. So that's basically what they're trying to explain in study unit 23. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Any questions? Nothing from my side. All right. So do we have a good understanding of exactly what is it that we're expected to know from risk financing? Remember, many students, they struggle with RSK.03 compared to other risk management modules. Why? Because the lecturer is trying to ensure that when he asks questions in the exam, do you have an overall understanding of why you're doing what you're doing so that you're able to apply this knowledge 
based on the questions that you ask you as well. So you are, you are now looking at it from an application perspective compared to undergrad where you were just claiming things and you just write those things down. It's now different. From risk financing perspective, they are checking more on, are you able to apply the knowledge that we've given you so far? So from the console, for you to be able to apply the knowledge that you've been given, you need to understand from study unit one to study unit 23, are you able to understand exactly how these different study units are linking together and what is the blueprint of why you're doing what you're doing in these different study units as well? Any questions? All right, so let's end here today. Remember, those guys who have access to, uh, to the user accounts on our website, you are able to access the, the videos. Please go through the videos for study unit one and study unit two. So in the next class, we are going to now look at study unit one. So in the next class, we're going to look at study unit one. Then the class after that, we're now going to look at study unit two. So in the next class, we're going to review study unit one. And then the class after that, we're going to look at study unit two as well. And please take note, assignment one, assignment two, assignment three, and assignment five. The concepts which are given as questions in those assignments, they don't really contribute much towards the questions that you find in the exam. Because it's those small questions that are asked, but they don't really contribute much towards the, um, towards the questions that you find in the exam. Because in the exam, it's more about application than just knowing small things. So which means because of that, assignment one, assignment two, assignment three, and assignment five, what I'll do is I'll give you uh, I give you a template of possible questions and answers. So you will see that based on that template, whatever short question that they give you, the, the answer is going to be given. So the, the answer would be given as well. So for, question, for assignment one, assignment two, assignment three, and assignment five, it's usually concepts which are not really highly examinable. I've never seen those concepts being examinable before, although they contribute towards your understanding of the overall risk, risk financing. So I'll give you uh, the, the template where you have the question, possible questions and possible answers as well. So which means now you have to check say, okay, my question that I've been given are these ones, uh, how is it now? So you have to look for the question and the answer based on the template that I give you. Start unit uh, assignment four, and assignment six, those ones, they are they contribute a lot towards the questions that you expect to find in the exam. Under normal circumstances, assignment four and assignment six is either questions that you've seen in previous past papers, or it's questions that you can expect to be examined at some point in the future, because it's now a structured type of question, usually based on a case type. So because of that, Assignment four and assignment six, even if you're checking your uh, tutorial uh, later as well, you will see that assignment four and assignment six, they carry the biggest chunk of the weight towards your, uh, towards your year mark than the other assignments as well. So because of that, assignment four and assignment six, we are going to be doing them together before the due date in class. So assignment four and assignment six, and this is, I promise you, assignment four and assignment six, if you need to make sure that you understand what you're doing, mainly because if you fail those two assignments, even if you pass very well assignment one, assignment two, assignment three, and assignment five, even if you get 100% on assignment one, two, three, and five, and you fail assignment four and six, you're not going to qualify for the exam. So assignment four and six is where the biggest chunk of your uh, weight of the mark allocation that you need for your year mark. So assignment four and assignment six, very, very important. Try attend the classes that are going to be doing those assignments because those assignment, uh, the assignment, the, those assignment classes are very, very important for you to be able to understand 
how does everything link together and how do you approach those questions so because they contribute a lot towards your final mark or your year mark then remember on our current timetable between now and the end of october that's when we are going to be going through the different settlements then november december january we are going to give you another timetable which is going to be for revision as well and uh so expect that timetable to come out sometime uh, beginning of October because that's when we'll be knowing exactly how far are we with finishing our our um our study units and also um uh, do we have enough time to finish or what do we need to do do we need to create some more classes because no matter what happens beginning of November we need to be starting with revision. Are there any questions? Any questions? All right. Can if there are no questions, yes. Hello. Hi. How are you? Yes. Good. Good. How are you? I'm okay. Uh, I just realized on the study guide that the assignment are are only for assignment. They yes. uh, there is only four assignments. The main one is the third assignment. So the other three is online ML MCQ. All right. I'll have to look at them because I see over time the lecturer is changing the structure of the assignments. Initially, okay. it was initially it was about three. It was two assignments. Then he increased them to four assignments. Then he increased them to six assignments. So if he's going to be cutting down on those assignments, because I need to look at the tutorial later as well. So if he's going to be cutting down on those, on those assignments as well, we need to check which assignments are getting the biggest weight. Because in most cases, the structured assignments are the ones where the biggest chunk of the weight uh, is. And that's where you find that, um, that's where you find that, that's where if you don't pass those ones, you feel you end up not qualifying for the exam. So I'll need to check because to be honest with you, in the previous years, we we're having six assignments. But if you look at these six assignments, when you look at now preparing, preparing for the exam, it was only two assignments that were very important for us to prepare for the exam. That's what we we're reviewing. The other assignments, we didn't even bother because I didn't see the relevance of us doing them because they were not, it's not, it's not things that you would find ever, you would ever find in the exam at all. So I need to check to see exactly uh, what are the assignments. Then we, if you check on the, uh, weights that each assignment is going to be carrying, you're able to see, okay, so these are the structured assignments and these are the uh, short questions type of assignments as well. So I'll need to just quickly review that because I need to get the updated tutorial later as well for me to be able to see what is happening. Hi, how are, are you? All right, good, good, how are you? I'm surviving. Um, I wanna ask because I downloaded um, the what whatever it looks like a timetable on the website but are you referring to quiz as assignments because it is i've got like three stated as quiz and one is assignment the first one starting on the third 05 2022 as a quiz i thought that was a test or something Usually, the ones that they give you as quizzes is basically assignments that you need to fill in online. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's usually those okay. assignments that you need to fill in online. And usually those assignments that you fill in online, they are usually multiple choice type of questions as well. So they'll be having okay. either a multiple choice type of question or they'll ask you questions where it's out. They're asking to say, is it true or false? So it's short. Okay, so it's like a small question. quiz test. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it opens like it opens and it closes. So you've got a given time or something. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Thanks. So, but for now, don't worry much about them. I'm going to be preparing to see exactly how do we approach the assignments. But I'll have a look at it. But it's nothing to worry much about because we already have the templates of exactly what to expect uh, on possible questions as well. So, uh, when the, when the time, of course, the first assignment is due in May, right? On the, yeah, it's you in, yeah, on the 3rd yes. of May. Usually the assignments are due in May, which means beginning of April, that's when we're going to be looking at the assignments, the first assignment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So sometime in April, we look at the first, uh, the first assignment 
because usually we say three weeks or so before the due date, that's when we go through the assignment so that you, we guide you on exactly what you expect. But usually those assignments that they give you as quizzes, don't expect it as the way of how they would structure the questions in the exam. Because in the exam, if you look at past papers, if you look at this year's past paper and you look at last year's past paper, the way they structure the quizzes is very different. Yes, we're going to go through them, but I don't expect that material to be something that I would say is emphasized for the exam as well, in most cases. So, but we have a look at it. Okay. Yeah, I'll have a look at it. Then I'll tell you a guideline on exactly how are we going to be able to approach those assignments. Okay, thanks. Yeah, all right. Are there any other questions? All right, um, enjoy the rest of your day. If you don't have access to the user account, whether you are attending the classes on trial basis or you have registered already, if you don't have access to the user account on our website, please send me a WhatsApp. I'll be able to respond to them later on today after my classes. But uh, please send me a WhatsApp so that I can give you the temporary access to the uh, website if you are doing it on a trial basis as well. Hi, Rhinos. Yes. Hello. Uh, yes. When is the next class for, for, for today? Check. If you check on the link that I sent you, there should be, or if you check on our website, the timetable is already there. Okay, okay, okay. So if okay. you check on our website, there's a timetable that we've uh, posted, which covers the classes that are going to be having between now until end of October, because that's when you should be done with the study, going through the study units. Then I beginning mean, of October, I, we'll post another timetable for revision as well. I mean yes? for, for today for other modules. Are we having them today, four and five? For other zero four and zero five? Yes. Yes, zero four, oh. remember RSK for zero four is starting at 11. Oh, so okay. we're going to be having it today. And RSK for zero five is starting at 11 and we're having it today. Although for zero four and zero five, we're not really, I'm going to avoid covering too much material because we have a lot of students who are still waiting for their results. And they are saying, you know what? I'm not in the right state of mind for me to be able to start doing other modules when I'm very anxious about the, uh, the, 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 the results as well, because we thought the results would be out on the 7th and the results are not yet out. So we are still waiting. So I don't want to uh, cover too much material before the before a majority of students join in as well, because uh, it's a lot of students who are going to be expecting to join in. But yeah, so we are going to have the classes but we're not going to move too fast. We're going to give you an overview and also cover some of the material from the uh, different study units as well. But we're not going to go and cover too much material today. Like what, because under normal circumstances, we cover as much ground as possible on the first class, but because they extended the registration to end uh, 31st of March, we cannot move too fast because we'll be disadvantaging a majority of students who are still to continue with their classes as well. Thank you. All right. All right, enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you, Mr. Renus.